Well, good evening, and welcome back to worship this evening. It's good for us to come together at the end of this day and bring our praise and worship to our Lord. In fact, I've chosen Psalm 92 for our call to worship, and I love the, the subtitle of this psalm, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. And the psalmist writes this, it is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. To the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the heart, for you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I will sing for joy at the work of your hands. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, you are in heaven high and lifted up, higher than our highest thoughts, and holy is your name. Beside you there is no other. You are God and you alone. We ask that you receive us into your kingdom, into your kingdom, the coming kingdom, the kingdom of your, the kingdom of your anointed son, Jesus, whose name we bear. Receive us, for we come to you in his name. We pray in him, in him and with him. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. I invite you now to please stand. Let's join together in singing, Holy, Holy, Holy.
And let's join our voices together in professing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Keith, could I borrow your pen? Sure. Oh, thank you. And we come now to an opportunity to come before God in prayer. If you have any prayer requests, we'd love to be able to pray for them tonight and in the days that follow. Yes, Linda. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, a thanksgiving for all the weather and the crops that are getting planted right now. Indeed. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Okay, so we want to pray for her co-worker whose husband passed away this past week. Yes, indeed, comfort in this time of sorrow. Anyone else? Well, let's, pr let's then uh, go before God in this time of prayer. Here you go, Keith, thank you. Oh, Lord, our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful, beautiful day that you have blessed us with, this beautiful weather. Uh, it shows us your almighty power, 
your power over creation and how um, beautiful the trees are as they have come into leaf. Uh, fields and lawns are green and, and uh, we are thankful for this season of the year where we can be outside and enjoy uh, the beauty all around us. You, O oh Lord, are a wonderful, almighty God. You love us and care for us. We're thankful for how you have kept us in your care in this past week. You have kept us safe. You have provided for our needs every single day. You love us and you care for us. And most of all, Lord, we thank you uh, that you have forgiven us through your son, Jesus Christ. And as we just sang, we are sinners without one plea. But in your mercy, you reached down to us and provided the means not only for our forgiveness, but also for our salvation. And for that, we give you thanks and praise. Father, we also thank you that on this day, we could enjoy this day of rest from our work. This first day of the week, we uh, do so knowing that you will provide for us each and every day uh, ahead of us. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, you have blessed us in so many wondrous ways as well. We're thankful for this good weather that uh, has enabled uh, seed to go into the ground and the farmers are, are busy in their fields. And we're thankful that uh, we can begin uh, another season of, of growing and cultivating and harvesting. And we pray for this season ahead and, and that uh, you will provide an abundant harvest. And most of all, Lord God, we pray too that you will keep all those who work in the fields and around uh, heavy, dangerous uh, machinery, that you will keep them safe and in your care. And we just rely on you in all things and in all times. We thank you, Lord, for um, a good congregational meeting this morning. And we're thankful for those who were ch chosen to be um, new elders and deacons. We pray that you will be with them for uh, these three years ahead, that you will equip them with what they need in order to do the work that you have called them to. We're thankful for those who retire uh, from their office uh, after serving you. And we're thankful too for those who have uh, done their work well and uh, have been faithful in serving this church. And so we uh, thank you again, O oh Lord, for providing uh, the next round of leaders for this congregation. We pray, Lord, uh, also that uh, you will continue to be with the search committee, and we're, we were grateful for the good report this morning that uh, there is uh, some possibilities out there, and we ask that uh, in particular you be with this uh, prospective candidate in Saskatchewan. We pray that you will bless him as he completes his studies at Calvin Seminary this fall, as he prepares to to, um, to be called into ministry. It's our prayer too, Father, that uh, perhaps this is the place that you have been working to prepare him for. But in the meantime, Lord, continue to bless us with your peace and your presence as we carry on with the work that you have called us to do here in the Martin community. And Father, we uh, thank you for um, all the many blessings you have bestowed on the members of this church. We celebrate uh, with those who are um, uh, acknowledging a, a time of blessing in, in marriages, of long marriages. We thank you for those who have been celebrating birthdays and we give thanks for, for long and fruitful lives. All these things, Lord God, come from your hand and we thank you for that. And Father, we pray for our denomination as uh, in a few weeks, uh, representatives from around the country and around Canada will be coming to Grand Rapids for our annual synod. We pray for the deliberations of this body and we ask Lord God that you lead and guide them as, uh, as they have to uh, work through a, a very heavy agenda with uh, many overtures. We pray, Father, that uh, you will be with all the delegates as they discern uh, your leading. And uh, 
it's our prayer, Lord God, that decisions made will bring honor and glory to you and to your church. And Father, we thank you also, uh, again, for our great nation. We thank you for those who uh, serve us currently in, in uh, the armed forces. They serve in faraway places, often far from family and home, and we ask, Lord, to bless them in their service, but also to keep them safe, especially those who are serving in places where uh, they face danger regularly. We pray, Father, that you keep them safe and in your care. We pray also, especially for uh, those from this congregation who are currently in the military, we pray that you will be with them and, and, and uh, keep them safe, but also bless them as they go about their training and preparations. Uh, we ask, Lord God, that uh, uh, you be with them every single day and keep them in your loving care. Father, uh, we also pray, too, now as we worship you with our gifts and our offerings, we pray for the, the work and ministry of Pine Rest. And uh, this is a, a time in our, um, in our lives when the work of Pine Rest is so very needed. So many people experience mental health issues, and we pray that you will bless the work of this organization as they uh, provide counseling and other services, and, and they do so in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. So please, Lord, bless uh, the offerings we are about to give. May uh, they multiply many ways through the work of Pine Rest. We ask this and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I forgot to pray for your friend, and I'm going to do that before the end of the service. All right. I invite the deacons to come up for uh, the offering. Thank you, Sarah. That was beautiful. And, and, and now I invite you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be continuing our series of, of uh, looking at the letters to the churches of Asia Minor. Today, a letter to the church in uh, Smyrna. And before we read God's word, let's bow in for a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather this evening to hear from you. We ask that you open our ears to your words, 
we acknowledge that we spend too much time speaking without necessity. But this evening, it's time for us to listen. So we ask that you change our hearts as we hear and reflect on your truths. We thank you for the many ways you speak to us. And as we open your word, may we be willing and ready to listen and obey. May your Holy Spirit guide us in all truth. And Father, we also pray for uh, Ruth's co-worker at the, at the death of her husband. We pray, Father, that you will bring her and this family your peace and your comfort. May they feel your loving care and support in this time of need. And please, Lord God, walk with this family in this uh, special time of need. We pray and ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we now uh, turn to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to look at the church, uh, the letter to the church in Smyrna, and we'll begin our reading at verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. This is the word of our Lord. Well, my dear friends, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I reminded you of something you already know, that, that these are difficult days for the church in America. We acknowledge that church America has, to a large, large extent, abandoned its Christian roots. Once our morals and values were those of the larger society, but, but not anymore. Once even those outside the ch church sought after truth, now many not only doubt that God exists, they even doubt whether truth even exists. And so as Christians and as the church, we face several challenges. Among them are this, do, do we have the courage to follow Jesus no matter the cost? What is call, Christ calling us to be and to do? And then above all, how do we get the good news of Jesus Christ out to our community? Now, this series is based on the seven letters to churches in Revelation 2 and 3, which, is, which we noticed are really prophetic messages from the risen Jesus to seven very real congregations in, in, in what we today know as Turkey, but what the Romans called Asia Minor. Christ sent these messages to those seven churches, but he intended them to be overheard by churches in every time and in every place. We're supposed to listen to each one carefully and glean from them what Christ expects from his church and then to apply the result to our own context, to our time and to our place. And I have to tell you, I really like these two chapters in Revelation. It reminds me of how we are a lot like the church in Ephesus, which we heard about last time. However, I have to say this, we're not much like the church in Smyrna, which we visit this week. But both messages do apply to us, and you will see how as we go along this evening. Um, and so I finished the, uh, the sermon on the, the first church by saying that I believe that God has brought us together as a congregation for just such a time as this. And it's true, we may get discouraged from time to time, but we have to, be, um, we have to trust that God is still working in us and through us. He is still working here in this community that if we are, will be faithful to his call, he will use us as a body of believers for his glory. 
And so all of these messages can help us then to be faithful. And going through these letters, I'm convinced that these messages to the seven churches are the heart of the book of Revelation. So a little review, the book of Revelation opens with a vision of Christ, and then we get these seven messages. Chapter four, that's a vision of heaven, and then after that, things quickly get wild from there. There are mention of bowls and trumpets, there's the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and all of which leads up to a vision of the final consummation of all things. Now, there's a lot of good stuff in these letters. Each one opens with an image of Christ drawn from the vision in chapter one. Each one ends with a reference to something that will come later on in the book of Revelation. And so this vision sets us up for the messages. The rest of the book serves as an explanation, a warning, and then it ends with a comfort uh, for those who hear the messages. And even, even the last two chapters in this book, uh, these last two chapters describe a new heaven and a new earth, show what awaits those who take these messages to heart. So now, we get back to Smyrna. Uh, what's, what's the story in Smyrna? Well, Smyrna is one of only two churches that Christ does not criticize in these seven letters. The other one is Philadelphia, not in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia and Roman Asia. So either these churches had no problems or Christ didn't think their problems were worth mentioning. But interestingly, these two churches were the smallest of the seven. And this should make us to stop and think, especially after we had a congregational meeting this morning where we approved a budget, you know. We should never judge a, a church by the number of people or the size of the budget. Bigger isn't always better. But these two churches, they had a heart for Christ. They were loyal. They were willing to pay the price. That was the secret to their greatness. Now, about the city of Smyrna. Smyrna was a port city. It was about 35 miles from Ephesus. And the thing to know about Smyrna is that it was intensely, passionately loyal to Rome. In fact, as early as 195 BC, the, the city of Smyrna built a temple to the goddess Roma. And then in AD 26, a little while before Jesus began his ministry, Smyrna beat out 10 other cities for the honor of building a temple to the emperor Tiberius. And th there was no way to attain social standing or economic prosperity in Smyrna in the first century without worshiping the emperor. And then on, on certain occasions, all citizens were required to sacrifice to the emperor. Every one of them had to burn incense before a bust of Caesar and then say, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord. And of course, Christians could not participate in this blasphemous idolatry. You see, following Jesus in first century Smyrna, it cost them a lot. You see, by not sacrificing to Caesar, you'd be kicked out of your trade guild. You could lose your livelihood. A trade guild would be the equivalent of a, of a union. Um, your property also could be confiscated. You could go to jail. You could be beaten. You could even be executed. So you might be wondering about this business of Jews and the slander that's mentioned in verse nine of our passage. Well, I trust that we're all familiar with the, the sad history of Christians persecuting Jews. And to that I say, may God forgive us for that. But you may not be aware that in the first century it was a, a completely different story. In the Roman Empire, new religions, new religions were not allowed, especially ones that refused to worship the gods of Rome. But the Jews enjoyed a special legal exemption, and they had certain protections. 
You see, the Jews did not have to worship the emperor so, so long as they prayed for the emperor. And then while the temple was still standing, as long as sacrifices were offered on his behalf. And so for a long time, Roman authorities could not tell the difference between a Jew and a Christian. Christians were considered a sect of Judaism. But as more and more Gentiles became Christians, this gap between the the Christian church and the Jewish synagogue, well, it widened and widened until the groups became far more distinct. When the Emperor Nero began to prosecute Christians in the mid-60s, in the middle part of the first century, uh, Jews were quick to say, hey, hey, uh, uh, those Christians over there, uh, they're a new religion. They're not part of us at all. And so Jews, for their part, did not like Christians because they considered worshiping Jesus as God to be blasphemous. And they also saw Christians as relaxing the law of Moses, and as you can understand, the Jews didn't like that either. And furthermore, the Jews were in a rather precarious position. There was always anti-Semitism going on in Roman culture. And after Judea unsuccessfully rebelled against Rome in around year 66 to 70, well, things got worse for them. Uh, They could not afford to be painted with the same brush as those troublemaking Christians. So that's a little bit of the background of what we read uh, here. What happened was, and we also see this in the book of Acts, because it happened to Paul and some of his friends, Jews would denounce their Christian uh, neighbors to the authorities. In a sense, they'd just rat them out. Hey, authorities. There's some Christians over there, and pretty soon the soldiers would come in. And then the authorities would then give uh, these Christians a chance to worship Caesar and curse Christ, and if they didn't, well, they were punished. And that's what our passage for this evening is talking about. And yet, some 60 years after John wrote Revelation, there were still Christians in Smyrna that were still being persecuted. The church in Smyrna was poor materially because of their loyalty to Jesus, though we can say they were rich, very rich spiritually. They had already endured persecution and Christ warned them that it was gonna get worse. So it causes us to just pause for a minute and ask, well, what do you think? Does their situation of being persecuted mirror ours in any way? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious. Obvious, Not really. They were materially poor. Compared to them, we are all materially rich. We, we live in the most affluent society in the history of the world, and even the poorest among us. They have, they have electricity. They have running water. But these Christians in Smyrna, they were slandered. Our faith, well, our faith is ridiculed in the larger culture, in TV, in books, movies, via Hollywood, all of that. But I would say, personally, we are not as persecuted as they were, or maybe we just aren't persecuted as much. And I could say, for example, that none of us have ever been sent to prison or been executed for our faith in Christ, nor do we expect that to happen to us anytime soon. So really, this church doesn't mirror uh, our situation well. However, we can say that the message does apply to us, and it does so in at least two ways. And the first is this. Even if we're not called to make the same sacrifices as Christians of of, uh, that day and age, and specifically uh, like the Christians in Smyrna, we are called to have the same level of commitment. So if following Jesus costs you something, then it's worth asking, are you willing to pay that price? Do you love him above all else? Now, what I can say is, and and there's even a 
a book by a, a title similar to what I'm about to say, Jesus has a lot of fans out in the church today. And by that I mean there are a lot of people uh, uh, that who suddenly, uh, and by that, uh, let me start over here. There are a lot of fans out in the church. And, and it reminds me of a little phenomenon that happened about seven years ago in 2016. What, does anybody remember the event in the end of 2016 that hadn't occurred in about 108 years? The Chicago Cubs won the World Series. Right? The Chicago Cubs won the World Series at last. And what had happened in 2016 is that all of a sudden, people were suddenly attracted to the Chicago Cubs. And um, a certain person in my life who was very important to me was one of those, my son. My son jumped on the Chicago Cubs bandwagon. He was all excited that uh, uh, they were gonna win the World Series. But here's the thing about my son. He had not suffered through one miserable season of heartache after another for most of his life. And likewise with Jesus. There are many people who admire him. They like the benefits that he offers, but they're merely fans. They're not followers. And they want the blessing, but without the commitment or any sacrifice. They like a little bit of Jesus in their life, so long as it doesn't cost them anything or inconvenience them too much. You see, hard times have a way of weeding out those fans from churches. They're the seeds that follow, that fall in the shallow soil in Jesus' parable of the soil, of, of the sower. When persecution comes, they wither quickly. And here's the thing about all of that. Jesus will have none of that. He says, with me, it's all or nothing. You decide, uh, but don't give me a quarter or a half or even 90%. And so, on one hand, it's, it's hard to know whether you would give your life for Christ as so many of those early Christians uh, did at one time, being tied to a stake, seeing the fire coming uh, down the path as a way of rattling one's resolve. So how could you or I know how we would do in that situation, how we, we would react if we were tied to the stake, so to speak? On the other hand, our commitment does show. If you love Jesus above everything else, that's going to come out in your life. It'll, it'll show in your priorities. It will show in how you handle life's ups and downs. Easy, good times are spiritually hazardous because in those times we can tend to forget God. Hard times are spiritually hazardous because we can get discouraged. We tend to get discouraged and give up. Only when Jesus is the source of your peace and your joy can you take the ups and the downs and not lose yourself. And so I, I really hope that we never face persecution like they did in Smyrna or like some Christians face today in different parts of the world. I, I often wonder how Christians do it in places like China, North Korea, uh, in the Muslim world, for example. But whether we do or not, are you so committed to him that whatever price you have to pay, you consider it not a loss, but rather gain? So that's first. Second, Christ encourages his suffering church to faithfully endure her earthly afflictions because Christ has given us a divine purpose for the church's suffering. In verse 10 of our passage, Jesus lets them know that their sufferings and afflictions are not yet at an end. In fact, they're about to intensify. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, we need to understand that this span of 
10 days is meant to indicate an undetermined but specific and relatively short duration of time. I also want to clarify a little bit of the translation in that verse. The NIV makes it seem as if Satan is using the threat of imprisonment to, as a way of testing them. The problem with this translation is that it makes it seem as if there's no divine purpose behind affliction and hardship. So a, a better way to understand this verse is to say that Satan tempts us, but he doesn't test. Well, on the other hand, God tests, but he never tempts. And that's an important distinction because we also know that God's hand is in complete control over everything, even in the midst of Satan's tactics where he persecutes Christ's church. God exercises his sovereignty even in his church's darkest hour, hours and even in the most trying moments of our lives. And so with that, we can say God allows. He permits the persecution and the suffering and the death of Christians. God permits this for any number of reasons. But here's the thing. Not every reason is made known to us. And so when we read about the terrible things that are happening to those who profess Jesus Christ, well, yes, this ought to trouble us. We should be concerned when we hear of the hardship and the heartache that some have to endure. We wonder why the Lord would ever allow such hardships. But then, friends, in the end, we know that God has his reasons, and we know and we have to trust that they're always good. So even, when, even where we see pain and loss and tragedy, we can be confident that Christ is still building his church. And it even happens when, that when Satan persecutes Christ's church, instead of shriveling up and withering away, the church actually thrives in those times and places. Christians actually become stronger in the face of persecution. And, and that appears to be the reason uh, stated in our texts that these Christians in Smyrna, they're suffering so that their faith may be tested. God wants to test their faith, not to make them fall, but so as to build them up so that they will endure. God sends trials. He allows temptation. He even uh, permits occasional failures to break us down, all so that he might build us back up again and then strengthen us in our Christian walk. But then, toward the end of this passage, there's a promise. A promise. And you know what? This, this, this is for us, too. Jesus said, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, this crown, we have to think about this crown for a minute. This, this crown is not the, the crown of a king. It's not the kind of crown that we saw uh, Charles receive a couple of weeks ago in England. You see, this kind of crown that, Paul, or that the Apostle John is writing about is the crown of a champion athlete. You see, athletes were really big in those days, as they are in ours today. But winners were not given a trophy. They were given a crown, usually made of a laurel wreath. And so this is the crown that Jesus offers us, the crown of one who has, through his own strength and his own grace, overcome. The, cr the crown that the Christians of Smyrna and countless other faithful believers, they too have been given this uh, crown. They have won this crown. And it's also important to note that this crown is not a literal crown. It's the crown which is life. And that's why Christ asks us to be faithful until death, no matter when or how death comes for us not compromising, not comp conforming to the world, but all, in all, in all times, letting our light shine. And then we're reminded that God has the power. 
However small and weak we may be, if we love Jesus above all else and follow him into the world, into our daily lives to do his work, well, that's all he asks of us. And the important news then is, then he will take care of the rest. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the ways that you take care of us and provide for us and keep us mindful that even in times where we face heartache and trial, loss and imaginable hurt and pain, that you are there in the midst of of that and help us to um, be comfortable with the mystery even though we may not always know what your plans are for us but we know that you are working in us to strengthen our walk, to uh, use the events of our lives to lead others to you. And keep us mindful every single day, Lord, that many people are watching us. They're watching how we handle the ups and downs of life. They're watching how we endure uh, not just uh, success and prosperity, but also uh, hardship and times of difficulty. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you so that then our light may shine for others to see. We ask this and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's stand now and sing together. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And my dear friends, I invite you now to receive God's parting blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of God our Father, his Son Jesus Christ our Savior, and in the power and the glory of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.